Well, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians. Uh, we're in chapter 1. We're going to be continuing in our series in verses 12 to 21 together. Um, as you turn there in your Bibles, uh, it's a letter that's often referred to as one of the prison epistles. Uh, the reason is because Paul, as he writes this letter among Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, finds himself in a prison in Rome. Well, not a prison, he's under house arrest. And so uh, while he doesn't have, well, while he has some freedoms, he can at least write this letter, he can have visitors. Uh, he's being watched 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Someone's always watching him, and he can't just leave freely and do what he wants. But the fascinating thing about the letter of Philippians is it's a letter about joy. And it's a reminder for us tonight as we continue through our study that while Paul has chains on his wrists, he's got the joy of the Lord in his heart. And it's just a reminder that our joy is not dependent on circumstances. As believers and as Christians, our joy is in relationship to our confidence in our God, our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we all navigate challenges, difficulties, and adversities from time to time, uh, from week to week. We may be navigating some difficulties this evening, but we're reminded, even as we sing those songs, that the joy of the Lord is indeed our strength. Uh, as we entered into uh, Philippians last week, in the first 12 verses, uh, Paul introduced us to the letter, and he showed us what his source of joy is. The first source of joy in his life and in his heart, even as he's writing under house arrest in chains, is the, his affection and appreciation for these believers in Philippi. You know, as he finds himself unable to go about his missionary duties, as he usually does. He's already completed a few missionary journeys. He wants to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But while he is in chains, whenever he brings to mind the Philippian believers, he experiences great affection for them and love for them, and it fills his heart with joy. Uh, and just the first 11 verses in chapter 1 remind us of how important fellowship with God's people is. Uh, and the kind of fellowship that Paul speaks of is one where, you know, you don't just uh, come to one setting where we're reading the word or, or come to one service, but you have the kind of relationship where you have affection and appreciation for fellow believers. I mean, that's a significant uh, a difference from just coming to church and, and coming in and coming out, but actually getting to know people getting connected in small groups or getting connected into the body and serving with your gifts. And the, the kind of joy we're speaking of here is one that comes from his affection and his appreciation for fellow believers. Uh, and today we're going to see another source of his joy is that of looking beyond his painful circumstances to God's purpose behind his difficulty. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Like whatever difficulty we may be navigating or the adversities that we've gone through or are going through, our prayer tonight is that we can look beyond the difficulties, look beyond the adversities, and see God's purpose behind our troubles, our problems, and the struggles that we face. And so we find ourselves in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that this will Turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope 
that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Uh, the theme of the letter of Philippians is joy. Joy in the midst of difficulties and trials, uh, not just for Paul because he's looking beyond his difficulties to God's purpose behind his pain, and he wants to share that with these Philippian believers. Uh, he wants to share that with his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, those that he describes in verse 2 in his greeting as those who are recipients of grace and recipients of God's peace. And so as we take a look at the key to joy in the life of the believer, not just taking a look at the appreciation and affection we have for believers, but looking beyond our difficulties to God's purpose, uh, let's see what Paul has to say. Beginning in, of course, verse 12, he says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Um, as you enter into the text, you see a but. It's a conjunction of transition. And as we just spoke about in the introduction, uh, Paul just wrote in this greeting about his affection and his appreciation for the believers and for the saints. He knows them intimately. But he makes this transition with this conjunction for the very reason that he wants to encourage these believers concerning himself. Because not only does Paul have affection and appreciation for them, but they have affection and appreciation for him. Whenever he brings them to mind and thinks about them, they go through their own struggles. His heart is filled with joy because he truly and genuinely loves them. And he knows that when they think about him and that when they pray for him, they're burdened. Their heart breaks for the fact that this Paul who's ministered to them, who's planted their church maybe a dozen years prior, finds himself in difficult circumstances. He finds himself in chains. He's in a bit of a crisis. He doesn't know if he's going to live or if he's going to die. And Paul's not thinking about himself. Paul is thinking about these believers. And so he writes to them and he says to them, listen, I want you to see past my difficulties to God's purpose behind my pain so that you can experience the same joy that I have. And that is the message for us tonight, that in the midst of difficulties, we would be reminded of these truths again and again and again and remind others of it that hopefully we can look beyond our difficulties to God's purpose behind our pain. So he begins and says, but I want you to know. Paul, as we said, is the author. He's the writer. Uh, he's finished up about three missionary journeys when he finds himself unjustly, um, uh, unjustly arrested. And he's got the Jews and the Gentiles, like the Romans, who are accusing him of various things. And he goes on this long journey of being imprisoned, and then he gets shipwrecked, and then he ends up, long story short, in Rome in prison, waiting to appeal to Caesar. And Paul's desire, if you read the book of Acts, is always, his, his heart was always to get to Rome because he wanted to preach, pr preach Christ and him crucified to anyone and everyone who would listen. In Rome, I mean, if he's going to reach not just thousands, but millions, that's a, that's a key city to get to. And so his heart has always been to be a preacher in Rome, but he's in Rome now, not necessarily as a preacher, but as a, a prisoner. But we're reminded that adversity never hinders your ministry. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it. So even though Paul may be in chains, the gospel is not in chains. And Paul writes these letters, Philippians, Ephesians, Philemon, Colossians, to the churches as others are going out, continuing the work of ministry. And so Paul, even though he's not preaching the way that would be most ideal, he's still preaching and the word is still going out and the word of God cannot be chained. So no matter how difficult the circumstances may get in the church in America or the church around the world, Christ is still going to build his church 
His kingdom is going to come and his will is going to be done. And so what a reminder for us of the hope that we have. So Paul says, but I want you to know, and he speaks to them and he describes them as brethren. You know, if you want to experience fullness of joy in your life, it comes with knowing your identity. It comes with knowing who you are and who you were created to be in relationship to God, in relationship to one another. And Paul is, um, uh, you know, particular in the, the manner in which he speaks to these believers. He calls them, them brethren. Uh, and before you can be brothers and sisters in Christ, you first have to be adopted sons and daughters. And so as Paul writes to them, he reminds them who they are as brothers and sisters in Christ. And he reminds them, if we go back to verse 2, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and the Lord Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He reminds them that their identity as brethren are first adopted sons and daughters. They are recipients of grace. That's a reason to rejoice. That when people ask you how you're doing today, you can say, blessed and highly favored. Not because of anything I've done, but because of the heart of my Father. I am better than I deserve. I love when people say, like, how are you doing? Better than I deserve. And that kind of catches people off guard. And they say, well, what are you talking about? Well, let me tell you a little bit about grace. Let me tell you a little bit about what my Jesus has done for me. And day by day, moment by moment, we make mistakes. We sin from time to time. And our hearts, prior to accepting Christ, the Savior and Lord, uh, we find ourselves in rebellion against God. We're still fighting this nature. And thanks be to God that we are blessed and highly favored. We're better than we deserve. And so he calls them brethren, but we're reminded back in verse 2, they're blessed and highly favored. Secondly, they're recipients of peace. Peace to you. And that's why it's important for us to remind each other from time to time. It may feel a little bit uncomfortable we're not in a liturgical setting, but it doesn't matter. We should tell one another as believers, whoever they are, if we know they're Christians, peace to you. You know, we've got peace with each other, and we've got peace with God. We were separated from, by sin, and God, through His grace in Jesus Christ, reconciled us, not just to Him, but to one another. We live in a culture and a society that talks a lot about justice and racial reconciliation. But guess what? You can't find racial reconciliation until you first find reconciliation with the Father and truly understand what peace with God means so that we can find peace with one another. So seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. It begins by walking humbly with our God. And then we know what justice is, and now we know what it looks like to walk in mercy. And what a reason to rejoice that we are recipients not just of His grace, we are highly favored, better than we deserve, but we are recipients of His peace. Not just with Him, but with one another. This goes back to the affection and appreciation we should have with one another. That we have the ability to not just say it because we say it, but because we truly love our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know what a joy stealer is in the life of the believer? Is knowing Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and for whatever reason, not getting fully connected into the body of believers. Uh, if you want to see a joy stealer, that's it. A lot of people say, well, I don't, I've been hurt by the church, and that's understandable. We... We're a church of imperfect people, and no church is perfect. Some people say, I've been hurt by the leadership. Or someone in leadership might say, I've been hurt by the church in this capacity or that capacity. And for that very reason, some people just say, I'm not going to attend church. I'm, I'm a Christian, and, and that's enough. Other people will say, I'm going to attend services, and I'm, but I'm, I'm going to kind of back off a little. I don't want to get too connected because... You know, my past, my past experience, they've been difficult and they've been painful, but that's a miserable place to be because the source of joy in the life of the believer is not just finding reconciliation with God, but being reconciled with one 
another. And if we want to experience fullness of joy, it's found not just in relationship with God, but in relationship with one another, the kind of relationship that is affectionate and appreciative of one another. So that I can genuinely say, peace to you. Grace to you in the name of our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And if nothing can separate me from God's love, why is anything separating me from loving my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? If he's forgiven me, can I have the heart to forgive those who have hurt me? And what will happen when you take that leap of faith and that step of faith and walk the way that God has called you to walk, you experience the fullness of joy we're speaking of here in Philippians. So we see, he says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, Paul begins by talking about his pain and his problems, his difficulties and his adversities. He says, the things that have happened to me you know about, and I know you love me, you guys appreciate me and you have affection for me. And when you think of me, I don't want you to get depressed or fearful or overwhelmed, but I want you to rejoice because I want you to look past my pain to God's purpose behind it. And so he describes his pain, those things that have happened to me. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't go into detail about it. He's about to. But what we're going to unpack in a moment are his chains. He's in a difficult place because he's not free to go wherever he wishes. Yeah, he's got some freedoms to write a letter, to have visitors over, but he's not completely free. He's got these chains, and you can easily take a look at your chains and get a little bit depressed. God, why me? Not Paul. He's looking beyond his difficulties. He, he, even, he even goes beyond that to, to encourage the fellow believers instead of saying, you guys need to pray for me. He's saying, I want you to have the right perspective and experience fullness of joy in your life. So he sees these things that have happened to me. His chains, he's got critics we're going to talk about. He's got his haters. You know, haters are going to hate. Maybe you've got your haters tonight. And you think about them and they've caused you problems. How in the world am I supposed to have joy when I've got a hater at work? When I work with this guy as my boss, the people that I deal with, man, I've got friends, but they're a little bit critical from time to time. How am I supposed to have joy when I've got this person as a family member in our family and they're causing a bunch of trouble, you know? So he's got critics. He's got those folks who are causing him trouble, these dis, dis, uh, detractors concerning the faith. And so he's got his chains, he's got his critics, and he's got a crisis on his hands because he doesn't know if he's going to live or he's going to die. We're going to see tonight in a moment, he's going to unpack all three of these for us. Uh, but as he talks about it, he says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I'm going to be delivered some way from these chains. Either God is going to set me free, I'm going to continue to preach Christ and him crucified, or I'm going to die and that's gain, and I'm going to be with God and his people forever and ever, but I've got the joy of the Lord in my heart. This is a man who can look beyond his difficulties, look beyond his adversities to the purpose behind his pain and the struggles that he's going through. So we see the pain, and then we see the purpose. He says in the verse, he says, I want you to know that which has happened to me has actually turned out for what? The furtherance of the gospel. Despite his adversity, God is using his adversity as a tool to advance the good news of Jesus Christ. That doesn't make any sense, right? But we're going to unpack that in a moment. The truth of the matter is, adversity doesn't hinder your ministry. God can actually use it as a tool to use you as a testimony, not just to a dying world around you, but to fellow believers to encourage our faith one with another. And so what an amazing thing that Paul says, look past my pain to the purpose behind it that God is working all things for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. So instead of getting depressed about my situation or becoming fearful because of your own life, what if I preach the gospel? What if I do that? What if I do this? Rejoice. 
because you better believe God's got a purpose behind my pain. Even before Paul began his ministry, in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 to 16, you know, God told Ananias, he said, this is a man who's a chosen vessel of mine who will preach before Jews and Gentiles before kings and who will suffer greatly for my name's sake. In other words, God already knew he was going to suffer. Paul didn't know exactly how the suffering would work into the plan of God, but through his suffering, God has advanced the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, our response naturally to difficulty, adversity, and struggles is God, why me. It's natural. It's fleshly. It's, you know, we look inward, and that's miserable. God, how could you allow this to happen to me? God, after all, I've been faithful to you over the years, attending church, serving others. God, why do we, I mean, I see the people next door, and they're blessed, and other families. Why me? And Paul's saying, that's a miserable place to be. But Paul is not interested in himself or his own difficulties, but he cares about others in advancing the gospel in Christ and him crucified in all things. So before we unpack the chains and the critics and this crisis, he doesn't know if he's going to live or die, uh, God uses the tool of adversity to advance the gospel. And so the question this morning, tonight for us, is how is God using your adversity or my adversity or how can he to advance the gospel? How in the world can God use the current pain and problems I'm facing as a testimony of his faithfulness and his goodness in my life? Just a, a few takeaways. Number one, ask God to show you the greater purpose behind your pain. That's where you begin because it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. God knows if you're facing some difficulties tonight, you know the troubles that you're, you're facing. And so it's, it's just come falling on your knees and say, God, please help. You know, I, I really don't know how to navigate this and it's hard for me to look beyond my problems because that's all I can see. Uh, it's hard to look beyond my critics. They cause me a lot of trouble. I mean, it's hard to look beyond all of the hurdles that stand before me. You want me to do this, and it's like, God, but I surrender to you in this moment. Guide me and direct me. I'm going to be a faithful servant of yours. And if you want to advance the gospel in some way through this, please show me and help me to be available to you. One of the ways we do that is when he shows us to share our testimony. And if you want to be a little transparent tonight or a little open tonight about sharing... As you look back on some of the difficulties that you faced in the past, it could be a difficulty you're facing in the present. How has God, as you look past that problem, showed you his purpose behind the pain? How has he used some of the difficulties you've, you've gone through to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? And as you think about it, I'll share a little bit about us. You know, Our first daughter was born at 32 weeks she was in the NICU for, you know, 40 days. That was a difficult time for us. You know, a lot of things we didn't know what happening with my wife's health and with our daughter's health. And that was one of those times where it's like, God, all I can see are, the, are, are all the things that could go wrong. And Lord, I, I really need to trust you. I need you to help me to see how you've got a purpose behind some of the difficulties or adversities we're going through. And it's just fascinating to see how how your church family comes around you in a season like that and starts to pray for you. And in moments like that, you can't help but say, God, thank you. I'm very appreciative of my church family. And I thank you for the affection that they have for us. But on the other side of it, what a blessing to know that as they are praying in real time, we're giving updates that God is taking care of this child, that no health problems are happening. In 40 days in the NICU, she's out and no problems at all. And the church's faith begins to grow and the gospel continues to advance. And we say all to the glory of God. Does anyone want to share tonight how God has used maybe a past difficulty to, to shed light on the gospel in your life or maybe in 
in your circumstances. Yeah, Tasha. So a terrible time with fires, burning houses, and yet God is faithful and people are sharing testimonies of God's goodness and people caring, the church doing what it's called to do. What a blessing. Amen. Um, any others? Anyone else want to share tonight? Yeah. You pray, you pray in your heart that, that God is starting to move, move in your heart and your mind tonight and saying, you know, I didn't really look at it that way. Or you look at some past things and you say, well, God, I guess you were doing something in my past. Or maybe you're doing something tonight, right now, and showing me the purpose behind my pain. That beyond the difficulties I'm going through, you're still faithful, you're still good, and you're working all things for the good of those who love you, who've been called according to your purpose. So first, ask God to show you the greater purpose behind your pain. Secondly, enjoy your ministry don't just endure your ministry. You know, we often look at the pastors or elders as the ministers of the body. But Ephesians 4.11, we know, says, he, he himself gave some to be, you know, apostles, pro, evangelists, prophets, teachers, and preachers. And then it says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And so the pastor or the elders, they, they serve to, you know, preach and teach and equip the saints. But all of us are ministers of the gospel. You know, when someone asks you who's, who's your minister or who's your, who's your, who's your well, if they ask you your pastor, yeah, I guess you could say that. But when it comes to the ministry of the church, it's, it's the church body. We're all ministers in one way or another. And the question is, what is your ministry and, and how is God using that ministry in such a way that you have joy to have it? That you're not just enduring it, you're enjoying it. A good example of it is parenthood, you know? It's a ministry. It is, and sometimes it feels as if we're enduring it through the different seasons of a child's life, and other times it feels like we're enjoying it. God calls us to enjoy that ministry. It reminds us if, if, if you're a stay-at-home mother, what a, what a blessing and, and what, a, what a calling to, to empower and encourage your children, the next generation, but you're with them 20 Four hours a day, seven days a week, and sometimes it just feels like I'm just enduring. And God wants us to enjoy that ministry. You know, I was uh, chat with with a, a girl mom or girl dad, excuse me, a girl dad uh, this morning, and uh, we were talking back and forth, and I was sharing about how uh, we've got you know a three year old and a one year old, and he was sharing about how he's got he got a teenager now, you know, and he was saying. They grow up so fast, and he, he's telling me, I, I miss those days where I, I could just change the diaper. <laughs> and I said, really? Why, why, do you meet, why do you say that? And he says, well, it's easier to change a diaper than to change a bad attitude. And I said, oh, okay. So you see those challenges. Are we, are we enjoying it? Are we enjoying the ride? Or do we find ourselves enduring it? That's the same for every ministry we've got. All the callings God has, if it's in the workplace and you've got critics at work and you're just trying to make ends meet from day to day, week to week, don't just endure it, enjoy it. God's got you there for a purpose and a reason. When you talk about a, dif a disability or something that you're going through, a health issue in your life, you say, what in, the, what in the world, what's the purpose behind this pain? And yet God's got you in different environments and situations with doctors, with nurses, and, 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 and in the waiting rooms and different places. And God has a unique ministry for someone in a difficult circumstance like that who can look beyond the pain and see perhaps God has a purpose behind this in some way to advance the gospel through the adversity that I'm going through. Enjoy your ministry. Don't just endure it, whatever it may be. And then thirdly, rejoice when the kingdom of God advances through suffering and through blessing. It's, it's exciting. When the church grows, when God blesses it, when your ministry grows, your small group, your Bible study, when a family grows and your ministry grows, and all those things, but also keep an eye out 
or how God is using difficulties, ad, ad, adversities, and struggles to advance the kingdom of God. And whether in good times or in bad times, praise be to our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ because he's good and he's faithful. So that way, you know, we're not just praising God in good times, we're praising God in the hard times as well, knowing that he's the same God in good and bad times. Uh, as we continue to read, we, we unpack these different categories. How is the gospel advancing it, through Paul's circumstances? Um, he talks about his chains first in verse 13. So that, it, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul begins and he says, listen, my chains, these adversities through my chains and my imprisonment have served to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. How? Through two ways, evangelism and edification. How amazing is that? Paul is in chains. You'd think, why in, the, why does, in the world does anyone have a reason to rejoice? Paul is kind of an odd character, but now he's telling the church to rejoice over his difficulties. He's saying, because as I'm in chains, I still got, I got people chained to me. <laughs> people watching me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, they've got their six-hour shifts or whatever that may be with the Roman guard, but they're always there. And what an opportunity that evangelism comes to him. <laughs> he don't have to go out anymore. He's just in his house under house arrest doing his thing. But God is saying, hey, wake up, start sharing the gospel, start sharing your faith and start shining the light in the midst of the difficulty. See the purpose behind your pain. My cha your chains have a purpose behind it. It says in verse uh, 13, so that it become evident to the whole palace guard. Who are the palace guard? These are the folks who are watching him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we've said. But a better way to describe them is it's his mission field. <laughs> you know, he's done three mission journeys. He, he's, he's gone on these incredible journeys and literally spread the gospel or been the major means by which God has taken the gospel, not just to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, but literally to the ends of the earth. Now he's stuck under house arrest, chained to some guards. And guess what? Those are his mission field. And he's going to be faithful when he's just chained to a couple guards as he will be if he's preaching before thousands because he knows who his mission field is. Who's in your mission field? Could be your family members, your ch own children. When we're talking about the mission field. We're talking about discipleship from that first step and in introducing them to Jesus as their Savior and Lord to the rest of their life of discipleship as they're growing and they're maturing in their faith. Who's in your mission field? Who's in your mission field in the workplace? Who's in your mission field as you're navigating some difficult times in your life? Who's in your mission field as you head to the grocery store and you walk through the same line every time and you always see them there? Who's in your mission field? And God is using his difficulty to advance his, God's kingdom through it. So through evangelism, and then verse 14, through edification, and most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident of my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Notice there it says most of the brethren, not all of them. It's a scary time to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a fearful time. I mean, you get thrown in prison like Paul. You could have your life taken from you. There's a lot of reasons to fear, but not everybody, but m most people, as they take a look at Paul's testimony and how he remains faithful. He's still writing the word, and he's still interacting with guys like Timothy and, and Luke and, and, t and all the rest, all the other companions that he has, and the gospel is still going out, and people are being encouraged. If God's been faithful to Paul, he'll be faithful to me. Somebody's got to do the work of ministry, and his testimony encourages others as well. well what a reminder that as you're going through some adversities or difficulties, trials 
of all kinds, things that you could have never imagined, health issues that you're navigating, saying, why me? Perhaps God is setting you up for an opportunity or has set you up for an opportunity to encourage someone who's going through the same thing. You've come out on the other side and you can say he is faithful, he is good, and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Trust him, he is God. Be still and know that he is God. Maybe that's why he allowed that adversity or that difficulty to come. Who are those people that you can encourage, that ministry that you can continue, that ministry that you can build around you? And so the, the purpose behind this was uh, evangelism and, and edification. Um, and I want to open it up to us uh, tonight. Do you, do you have any examples of ways someone's faith in the face of difficulty has encouraged you? As you take a look back on your life or even today, as you think back, on people who've endured hardships, health-wise, loss of a job, just navigating some trials. But as you've watched them trust God, how have they encouraged you? Does anyone want to share? Yeah, Greg. Hmm. Amen. Just watching a former elder just navigate cancer. And even though he's in remission, he's, God's been good to him and continues to be faithful. Amen. Any, any others? Anyone else want to share? <laughs> Amen. Thanks for sharing, Sherry. God gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, whether it's $10 or a couple million. God is good, yeah. Anyone else want to share? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's wonderful. And just being faithful and watching God be faithful. That's so good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as we walk through here, let's see. Live above your circumstances, not under them. You know, uh, we can find ourselves whether it's Paul with his chains or an adversity we're going through, just finding ourselves beaten down by our difficulties again and again and again. And the manner in which we rise above them is by means of having God's perspective. Just looking beyond 
the difficulties, looking on beyond the adversities and seeing God's purpose behind them and rising above them in the midst of it. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, focus on your mission field and not your misery. <laughs> so easy to get miserable, you know. And it's easy, you know, like um, misery loves company. And we can find ourselves being complainers instead of saying, what's the opportunity God has given me in the midst of this? And who's in my mission field? And how does God want me to shine the light of Christ through this? And thirdly, as we consider the chains of Paul, encourage others in the midst of your own difficulty. Uh, your testimony doesn't end or doesn't begin when your pain ends. Your testimony is ongoing. And as you continue to face some adversities or difficulties, as God's been faithful today, testify of that. As he's faithful tomorrow, continue to praise him for that and share the goodness of God moment by moment, day by day. And so the gospel advanced through Paul's chains. That's how his adversity um, God used as a tool to advance. And secondly, the gospel advanced uh, through his critics. It says in verse 15, he says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. So there are some detractors for Paul. Paul's got two folks by his side. He's got those who are critics, those who don't really like Paul or see an opportunity uh, to uh, minister or fill in the gap where he's kind of left it out. And he's got those who are companions, those who are preaching the gospel with the right motives. And so these critics aren't necessarily preaching a false gospel. They're just preaching a gospel with the wrong motives. So I have to ask the question, is it possible to pre preach Christ and Him crucified and minister in the manner in which God has called us to with the wrong motives? The answer is yeah. <laughs> you can ask a somebody to do something for you, whether it's your spouse or maybe it's a child or, or just somebody at work, and they can do the right thing with the wrong attitude. And Paul says it clearly here. He says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. So their motivation isn't right, but they're preaching the gospel, and yet they don't like Paul, and they would like nothing more than for uh, his life to end or, or his ministry to, to, to fall apart. But it says they preach from envy and they, they preach from strife. So what's their motivation? Number one, envy. They like Paul's influence. He's done three missionary journeys. He's planted all these churches. He's been the one God has used to take the gospel to the ends of the... You're talking about Paul the persecutor? The one who, who was trying to kill Christians and now he's the one preaching the gospel and bringing it to the ends of the earth and now he's in prison? He must have been, done, done something wrong. You know, you don't end up in prison for just any reason. And so you've got some folks who want to preach the gospel out of envy. So Paul is in prison uh, or under house arrest in Rome. And they say, listen, we're going to do what we can do to, 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 to further our ministry. And it's just a reminder that as you minister and serve with your gifts, guard against envy. And you guard against that by comparing yourself to others. If my ministry is my children... It's very easy to compare my children with the children of others. God, why are they giving me such a hard time? And those children are just so, so happy and blessed all the time. It's, it's easy to compare ourselves with others. It's easier to compare our ministries with others. It's easy to, to compare our churches with others. But the only thing that Twin Rivers should be looking at is not the other churches, but the word, the authority of God's word. And we see what a church is supposed to do. We see the functions of the church in Acts 2, 42 to 47. And our focus should be on the word instead of comparing ourselves to others. But we can say, you know, oh, these, these folks who are preaching out of envy and strife. But it's so easy to fall into that when we lose focus of what our true calling is. That it's about Christ and Him crucified. It's not about the size of the ministry, but whether or not I'm being faithful 
to the people God has put in my circle of influence, whether in the church, in my individual ministry, let's continue to stay faithful to God in that. Secondly, not just out of envy, but their motivation is strife. You know, they're, they're not looking at what's best for Paul, and they're not look, looking for what's best for the church. They just want to get ahead and move forward. And so Paul is dealing with his critics, but it says also in verse 15, it says, some also out of goodwill. <laughs> Others are preaching out of the right motives. We're talking about those who have been with Paul throughout his many missionary journeys. Timothy, who he writes alongside one of his associates, we think of folks like John Mark. You know, remember on the first missionary journey, he says, get John Mark out of here. I don't want nothing to do with John Mark. He left us and deserted us, and Barnabas was like on the second missionary journey. Well, I'm going to go with John Mark because I'm a little bit more gracious than you, Paul. And Paul took off. Well, John Mark gets restored to the ministry, and Paul, in, in a later letter, says, hey, I need John Mark. We're talking about guys like John Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. We're talking about Luke, a guy like Luke, a physician, who writes to us a two-part volume of Luke Acts. And we've got these incredible companions of Paul who are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ who preach the good news from the right motive so that Christ might be honored, that he might be glorified above all things. Verse 16, how does Paul respond to his critics? Does he get upset about them? Does he... He points fingers and says, take these folks out. He says this, the former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Verse 18, what then? For the, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. And then if you didn't hear him, he says, yes, I will rejoice. What a testimony. Paul looks beyond his difficulties and the adversity, not just of his chains, but of his critics. And he says, I'm going to praise God anyways, because even though they've got bad motives, Christ is still being preached and him crucified and people are coming to faith. Praise be to God. And where the gospel is preached and proclaimed, that's what Paul is interested in it. You know, in verse 21, he's going to say, to live is Christ, to die is gain. You know what his, his mission in life is? To preach Christ and him crucified. It's all about Jesus. And if he's glorified, even if it, it, it doesn't look well on me, as long as God is, that's what matters. That's what matters. And so just a, a few takeaways as God uses the tool of Paul's critics to advance the gospel. Uh, number one, expect critics and haters. Haters going to hate, right? So I want to ask and open it up to us tonight. Uh, when it comes to your critics and when it comes to your haters, uh, what are some options to respond to your critics and those who may not be the best supporters or companions as we see here? What's some responses that we can give them? And you can share some bad responses. Some mistakes. Yeah, yeah. How do you deal with a critic? Be critical back? Yeah, like, well, I got some things to say to you. Yeah. <laughs> anything, any, anything else? Yeah, so surprise them with kindness. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It surprises them, yeah. Yeah, sure. We can pray for them. Amen. Yeah. We can pray for our critics. Ask God to work in their life and in their hearts. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Let them share a little testimony with them. Sure. We can do that. Yeah. 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 There are lots of options. We've got good ones and, and, and bad ones. Uh, but one of our responses, of course, as we're seeing in our text, is, is by seeing God's purpose behind them. Like, God, why did you put this thorn in my flesh for such a time as this? Like, are you trying to grow my patience? Are you, are you, are you want me to share my faith with them and the gospel in this? God, how can I see and what you're doing that you're advancing the gospel through 
uh, these critics in the midst of it. Uh, secondly, guard your heart against jealousy and strife. You know, check the motivation for your ministry tonight. What's your ministry? Identify that. It might be your family. It might be in the church. It might be a small group or a Bible study. It might be those you lead at work in the workplace. Like As you minister to them, just check your motivation. Uh, thirdly, I think this is an important one. Don't take yourself too seriously. I think we as Christians can take ourselves too seriously at times. Take some time to laugh at yourself. Take the gospel seriously. Don't take yourself too seriously. Be more concerned about God's reputation. Don't be so concerned about your reputation. And if you've got to laugh at yourself every now and again and, and just go with the critic, <laughs> you know, I'll work on that. Shine the light of Christ. Glorify Him. Even if it makes you look bad and, and you know, you, you got your reactions, it's like, no, God, it's, it's all about you and I want to shine the light. And even though they've been nasty to me, I'm going to show them love and I'm going to pray for them and watch what God does in the midst of it. And then fourthly, uh, this is an important one, don't, don't be easily offended. I love this text in Ecclesiastes 7, 21 to 22. If you ever get offended kind of easily, this is a good verse to go back to. It says, also, do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you, because they do. For many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. Don't, don't take yourself too seriously and don't be so easily offended. You know, we at times find ourselves uh, losing control of our tongue and give people the benefit of the doubt and show them the grace that they need. As you work with your critics, show God's grace in the midst of it and watch what he does through it. So uh, the gospel advances through Paul's critics. And then lastly, God advances the gospel through Paul's crisis. Uh, beginning in verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, ashamed but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body whether by life or by death for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's facing a crisis. He's facing life or death here. He doesn't know if, when or if he's going to stand before Caesar and if Caesar's going to say in his court, you're done, Paul. Cut his head off, you know. Do what you got to do. Or if he's going to be released. And so he's facing a crisis. This is a crisis. It's pretty serious. And Paul says, whether in life or death, my purpose, my mission statement is that God would be magnified and that he would be glorified. So it brings us back to our adversities and our difficulties. Even if you're facing death itself. Or you can have an opportunity to encourage someone in the face of that. God, how are we magnifying you? How are we making much of you? Because when you focus on your problems, they tend to get bigger. But when you focus on your God, what ends up happening is you see things in the proper light in comparison to the greatness and magnificent, magnificence of our God. There's nothing that he can't handle. There's nothing too big for him. So God, may you be magnified in death or in life. And that's the mission statement that we kind of end with tonight and we'll pick up with next time. To live is for Christ, but to die is gain. In my family and in my marriage is Christ being honored and glorified. In the ministries of my church is Christ being magnified. In my circles of influence in the workplace or where I find myself in the grocery stores or at the doctor's office is God being glorified in all things. And the takeaway for us today is look beyond your difficulties to God's purpose behind your pain and then experience the fullness of joy that he offers in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Can we pray? Father, we know it's not easy as we take a look at this text. We see a wonderful example of one who, in the face of adversity, life and death, is a man who has fullness of joy. And Father, we know it's not about Paul 
We know it's about you. And Father, we know that the same God that Paul serves or served is the same God that we worship and serve. So Father, tonight as we look back on some past difficulties and adversities, give us the right perspective. Father, today, tonight, as we find ourselves navigating some difficulties of our own, whether in our families, in our relationships, in the workplace, with our children, in whatever capacity, Lord, you know each heart tonight. And, and Father, we just pray that you give us right perspective. Give us a heart for your gospel, Lord. Let us live for you. And Father, even in the face of death, may we see that we can also be joyful knowing that in the end, we get to spend eternity with God and his people forever and ever. Father, we thank you for these things and pray that we would be reminded of these things throughout the week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.